Amen. Come on, can we thank the Lord today? God bless you. Delighted that you're here. We're in a series called Together right now. I want to give a shout out just before I go any further to the Sisterhood team and Sisterhood Night Out this weekend. It was amazing. Woo! We had a fantastic time. God is so good. It was a really, really great event. And uh, so many relationships were built. Some folks came to Christ. Some ladies came to the Lord. It's just, it just amazing. It's awesome. Uh, and so I want to jump in today um, with an opener. It's just, a, it's just a little humor, okay? So here we go. Here we go. Once I was walking along the Golden Gate Bridge and I saw this guy about to jump. I said, don't jump. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What denomination? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? <laughs> He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Conference or Northern, Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Conference? He said, Northern Conservative ba Baptist Great Lakes Conference. I said, me too. You with me? Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Conference Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Con uh, Conference Council of 1912? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Conference Council 1912. I said, die, heretic, and pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> Shall I follow that? <laughs> Lord, Lord Jesus. Can we pray, Lord Jesus, thank you for changing our hearts and showing us how to love one another in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen and amen. Today we're talking about what every Christian needs, what every Christian needs, what every Christian needs. I want to talk for a second just about the problem. I just set it up. The problem is uh, the enlightenment, you know, that happened in the 17 and 1800s. We really focused on uh, linear thinking. And so we reduced what, what, what was common in Christianity was love and community. That's how the Christian uh, was distinguished among the nation from the time of Jesus until the time of the Enlightenment, especially in America. And then we became what some commentators call a brain on a stick. And so we became very linear. We became very denominational. We became, you know, point A to point B. And we stopped loving so much and we stopped communing, being in community together with one another. And after that, you know, you've got the Industrial Revolution. The 1800s and into the 1900s, the Industrial Revolution split the family as most of an agrarian society that was very communal. Generations lived together. Remember when generations lived together, you guys? Generation with generation, grandmas and great grandmas and grandfathers and sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. And when that changed in the Industrial Revolution, people started moving to cities and the nuclear family, everybody say nuclear family, was splintered. It was broken. And grandparents were separated from, from parents and then eventually the parents went to work because Everybody was working double jobs, moms and dads, so the parents then were outside of the home, and now even siblings, and you know, half the family lives over here, half the family lives over here, and the nuclear family was broken, it, it split. And then the invention in 1991 of the World Wide Web. The, do you remember that? We thought the world was gonna end in 2000. Do you remember that? It was, it's the end of the world. And so we thought, I mean, it was, it was incredible. And so earlier, so when the web was created and then the internet, the, those two interface, they're not the same thing. They interface with one another. That whole scenario then caused us to push the screen in front of our family members and our children. And, and look, we did it. We had crying kids and we said, here, look, you know, watch this for a minute. Uh, my wife did a fabulous job. Come on, can we give it up for moms in the name of Jesus? Give it up. My wife did a fabulous job. We went from time to time, you know, that screen was on. And so what we've got is what's called the disintegrated self today. And so that has led us to denominationalism. And that's what I set up in the joke was just the fact that if you're not me and you're not this one and you're not this, this version and this version and this version and this version, I don't fellowship with you. And that's crazy, church. That's crazy. That's why... I, I, 
leading pastors around the nation and even around the world are falling by the wayside because the development of character, the development of, of, of real Christian discipleship is not necessary any longer. The only thing you have to do is be able to talk. Come on, church. And so we, we're missing community and we're missing love and we're missing that kind of uh, espousement where we keep each other walking with Jesus. And then the all important issue of discipleship because in order to be a disciple of Jesus, I've got to be around, everybody say around, <laughs> around other people who love Jesus. I've got to, I gotta be face to face with them. I gotta sit with them. I gotta know them. I gotta relate to them. And their DNA uh, metamorphosis, metamorphosis happens in me because their DNA moves over to me. My DNA moves over to them. And in this culture and in this society, we're separated from one another and we're disintegrating as the church, and I'm so proud of our church because we are not disintegrating. Come on, can I give it up? Can you just give it up in the name of Jesus? I'm calling you to something greater, to something bigger. Everybody needs joy. Everybody say joy. joy. And then say chesed. chesed. You gotta say, when you say Hebrew, you gotta kinda k <laughs> Say chesed. chesed. <laughs> that was funny. Not that much k <laughs> Just <laughs> Chesed, chesed, chesed. It's a Hebrew word. It means love. Everybody needs joy. Everybody needs chesed. And everybody needs this communal identity. An identity that is we instead of I. Come on, somebody. We. It's we. All of the Pauline epistles are live therefore for Jesus because we believe. Live like this. Why? Because we believe. Walk like this. Why? Because we believe. Talk like this. Why? Because we believe. Uh, handle sexuality like this. Why? Come on, church. Because we believe in the holy word of God. We believe. So let's talk for a second about joy. Let's talk for a minute about joy. <clears throat> Write this down if you're taking notes, okay. Building joy and relational attachments are key. They're two keys to building discipleship in Jesus. I wanna read you a quote from a, a book that I just read, The Other Half of the Church. Much of this comes from that book it's by Jim Wilder and Mitch Hendricks, Moody publisher. Um, here's what it says, watch this, this is pretty awesome. The prefrontal cortex grows to become about one sixth of the brain and is configured with neurological circuits representing three faces, <laughs> three faces engaged with one another, prefrontal cortex. Infants' brains develop identity through joyful interactions, usually with the mother and the father, and the joyful faces of the parents are combined with the baby's growing sense of self to form a, tri a triad of joyful interaction. In this ideal environment, it's ideal, lots of people have gaps in this ideal environment, but in this ideal environment, joy becomes the baby's strength. Everybody say strength. And this lays the foundation for a lifelong joyful identity. So what's happening is in us is if we miss that triad, isn't it just like Jesus to create in a baby's brain the prefrontal cortex that represents three faces? Come on, somebody. Just like the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know that God lived in community before we were ever formed, but God forms community in us by and through them. Come on, somebody, are you with me? So from our earliest formation, we need joy from the faces of those that we identify with before we even have language. Watch this, here's Jesus, Hebrews 12, two. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, some scripture, the one I memorized, it says the author and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy, everybody say joy. For the joy set before me endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What does that mean? It means that while Jesus was being crucified unjustly, then all the scorning faces, the scowling and the angry and the, the unjustified faces that were looking at him, he could look through their faces to the face of God, knowing that he would be in the presence of the Father, having died for us and been raised from the dead. Come on in Jesus' name. 
he, for the joy set before him, known from the Father's face. And in that one moment in Matthew and Mark, the Bible says that Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That's not, that, that's, that's nothing fancy. It means, Lord, Lord, why have you deserted me? Why have you forsaken me? And some Bible commentators say, that's the moment when God the Father had to turn, come on somebody, turn his face from the Son just for a moment. Why? Because he bore the sins of the world and a holy and just God had to just for a second look away from that sin. Do you know that Jesus paid the price for our sin on the cross? Come on, you guys. He paid the price. You can clap for that. Let's get it. Get it. the joy of the Father. You know, I've got a master's degree in theology and I had no more than a cursory understanding of the word joy. When translating the Bible, often the face of God and joy are taken out. I want you to see these here really quickly. Psalm 89, 15, the NIV translates, blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you to walk in the light of your presence, Lord. In the Hebrew, it says this, in the light of your presence is literally in the light of your face. Come on, somebody in the light of the face of God. It's not an isolated example. Lots of times the word joy and the face of God in their association and how important it is, is actually taken out in the transliteration from the original text to the text that we have. God's face is intimately connected to joy. Watch this, now watch this, watch this. And it's intimately connected to your ability to grow as a disciple of Jesus. The face of God because you're wired as a human being to receive joy connection that you can actually feel in your body, your soul, your being, your bones from the God who created you. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our, come on. The joy of the Lord is our, so the face of the Lord is our. There you got it. Psalm 1611 says, in your presence is fullness of joy, New American Standard. However, the original Hebrew renders the verse, abundance of joy with your face. Psalm 21 says this, when it's blessing of the king of Israel in verse six, the psalmist proclaims, you make him joyful with gladness in your presence. The Hebrew rendering is, you make him, this is the exact rendering, so it doesn't read exactly the way we want it to read. That's why we get the paraphrase translations. You make him happy with joy with your face. Come on, you guys, that's crazy. Do you know that you communicate in a 10th of a second to your children if you're happy or not with them? because in the right side of your brain, all of that's going on. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. They notice in a tenth, in a sixth of one second, joy or displeasure. Six, I go like this and they've already registered six times whether you're happy with them or not. It's okay, everybody breathe. So, I mean, you know what I mean? Some, our friends always say this, change your face. So we can change our face. And I want you to know that God, God's face towards you never changes. It never changes, church. The face of God towards you is always loving and always kind and always just. And he can look at you without saying a word and say, mm-mm. Come on, somebody. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 for God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory. Now, what, look how that, that lays out in the scripture. The light of the knowledge of the glory. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God displayed in the face of Jesus. So when we see the face of Jesus, we're understanding the light of the glory of the Father. And so when we go to have our quiet time, our quiet time isn't just A to B. It's not just linear. What God wants is God wants what you had when you first got saved. Come on, somebody. You remember that? When I got saved, I was in a, in a bedroom in Missouri 
in Columbia, Missouri, and I called out to God and God showed up. And when God showed up, I had a Damascus Road experience. I mean, God was bigger than my bedroom. He was bigger than my house. He was bigger than Columbia. He was bigger than Missouri. He was bigger than the state. He was bigger than the United States. He was, he was massive. And I felt, I'm telling you, I felt, God, I mean, I felt overwhelmed and undone. And I had this incredible, there was an incredible bright light that I would describe as kind of bluish. It was so bright, but I could still look at it. And I saw the face of God. I saw the face of Jesus that night. And when I got up the next morning, I told my living girlfriend, she'd been there almost five years. I said, we can't live together. So the face of Jesus will help you do that too. Here's the point. (laughs) Here's the point. God wants you to be discipled by the face of the one who loves you in the fullness of joy. And anything less than that is something less than discipleship because I'll tell you what happened to me. I felt it in my stomach. I felt it in my mind, my head, my hands. I felt like, I felt like my hands were glowing. And for two weeks, I was like the happiest person. I was like, I had taken happy pills. <laughs> Everywhere, I was like, what's up you guys? I was so happy because Jesus saved my life. Come on, Jesus saved my life. And what happens to us is we have an experience with the Lord and we come into discipleship and then we move into our linear left brain. Everybody say left brain and we leave the, the emotional compartmental place of the life of God that originates in the right side of the brain, say right side. right side. It's the right side. That really is expansive. It moves way faster than the left brain. It's the place where discipleship actually is filled with the fullness of joy and you're in the presence of God. That's when you know you're being discipled. We need joy. We need chesed. Come on, chesed. Hey, perfect, good job. Come on, give yourselves a hand. You all know Hebrew. Before we go on to chesed, I just wanna give you this little comment. The face of Jesus is important and so is the face of others. Um, and, and, and I talked about the brain for a second. What happens is when we receive signals is the facial, God has hardwired facial recognition in your brain. You, we're hardwired with it. We're faster than any computer. Six times a second, we're registering. Who am I and do I matter in the world? Who, who notices my life and does my life matter? Who am I? And the message comes from the back of your brain on the right side, and it's like walking up an aisle in the grocery store, and then it crosses over about where your eyes are, and it's like crossing over to the other aisle and then walking down the other aisle on the left side. Six times a second, a lot slower on the left side, and then you have recognition, you have six times a second, and then recognition and then speech. Amazing, just amazing what God does and amazing how he does it. So we're registering, you know that 90, they say over 90% of communication is nonverbal. You know, everybody with me? That's why when we know and we're known by other people, not a word has to be said. A picture's worth a thousand words. Eyes and facial recognition are signals of joy and affirmation. The other day I was with a group of pastors and I'm so overjoyed. I, I just, I, I can't tell you. I've never, I've been in pastor's meetings a lot before. And then uh, I stopped going because everybody was just comparing their ministries. And now being with a group of guys being with three other guys, we're really talking about what matters the most. And I was sharing something that was difficult the other day with them. And I noted my head, I didn't, I didn't know so after, but my head went down, my eyes lost contact with them and I was feeling shame and a degree of fear. And I looked up like this and all three of them were smiling really big at me. And man, you guys, I felt it in here. Right here. Sound like Hitch. Somewhere in here. I felt it. I, I left there with life. They didn't say a word. They didn't say a single word. But I left there knowing that they were for me and that they were with me. Come on, somebody. 
We need chesed. It means enduring covenant of love. It means love. It's the Hebrew word for love. And I want to give you some translations. Lamentation 3, 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. This word is so complex in Hebrew, the Bible uses lots of words to describe chesed, love, covenant love. Here, in the English Standard Version, it means steadfast love. In the other Bible translations, in the NIV, it means great love. In the NET, it means loyal love, loyal kindness. I'm sorry. New American Standard, loving kindness. Uh, King James, King Jimmy Version, it means mercies. New Living tra Translation, it means faithful love. 1 Peter 1, 2, 2, 1, 22 says, love one another deeply from the heart Later in the same letter, Paul says in 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply. Listen why. Because love covers a multitude, say it with me, covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Say it with me again. Love covers a multitude of sins. Wow, what a picture. This Hebrew word carries a sense of an enduring connection between people, one another, who love one another. It's not just married couples. It's men and women, men and women, boys and girls, aunts and uncles, grandpas and grandmas, children and elderly. Love one another with a life-giving love that's enduring forever. Why? Because they've been loved with that kind of love. And they've committed I'm gonna love the way Jesus loves and I will love you even if you're the source of my pain. Come on, somebody. Come on, can I get an amen? amen. Come on, can I get an amen? Real big. Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. I'm gonna love you. Why? Not because I'm commanded to, not because I ought to, not because my left brain says I have to, but because I have been loved. And because I have been loved, I'm going to love you even if you're the source of my pain because God removes the source of my pain in loving community. Mm. The only kind of environment you'll grow in. You will change not because you ought to change or because you learn to change or because you desire to change. All those things are good. How many of you have ever had this experience where you're like, man, this year, you know, we start out the year, this year, I'm going to be a great disciple of Jesus. And by the end of, you know, January 12th, you're not. <laughs> Everybody, you with me? Okay, desire, longing, fretting, worrying, trying doesn't get it. Let me tell you what does. Joy. You practice joy building in the presence of God. And man, Everything in your life changes and has said community, loving community. When you get around other people, all of a sudden you're like, I want to read the Bible. I want to memorize a verse. I want to go to church. I want to sing worship songs. Come on, somebody. I want to be people who, I want to be with people who love Jesus. I don't care about going to the bar. Come on, can I get an amen? I don't care. That's why Eddie James, who is the music artist, can take Young men and young women who are in, just in steeped in drugs and alcoholism and turn them into pastors. You know why? Because <laughs> he loves them and he demonstrates it every day. Nope, no, 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 no. Listen, God's love for you is bigger than your past. God's love for you is bigger than your problems. God's love for you, God's love for you. God's love for you. This is, not, this is not linear. The reason why we fall off is because we think that reading a book is discipleship. No, experiencing God is discipleship. In the presence with other people who experience God is discipleship. C.S. Lewis says this about the waning love that we have. The Bible says in, in, in the end, the love of most will go, grow cold because we're under trial. And so loving, come on, how many of you know that loving is hard? Loving is messy. If there's no ox in the stall, there's no mess in the stall. If you don't want a mess, you can't have an ox. Or I said, we say it like this. If you don't want a mess, you can't have a baby. But having a baby is pretty dang awesome. And having friends, come on, is awesome. But there's going to be a mess in the stall. Loving people through difficult circumstances is the way to live. Because what we choose to do is we said, I'm going to get rid of it all. I want the mess gone, so the ox has got to go. 
So we live in isolation. Here's what he says. C.S. Lewis describes the avoidance of love in his book, The Four Loves. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you wanna make sure to keep it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around the hobbies and the little luxuries and avoid all entanglements. And lots of people today in 2022, they're Christians, they love Jesus, but they will not, they will not expose themselves again to being hurt, too messy, too much at stake. And, and I just wanna to say to you right here in the middle of what I'm saying, it's worth it, church. Come on, it's worth it. Listen, it's worth it. Because mm, I'm, I'm preaching in the middle of my statements. He says, lock it up safe in a casket or a coffin. But in the casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it'll change. Your love will change. Listen, the love of most, our hearts have grown cold because I'm not letting it be exposed anymore to the reality of what loving people do and what loving people can do. But the potential that I can receive from loving people is way bigger than the potential of being hurt by people. The potential. Church, it matters so much. So much. Being in community is about redeeming our heartaches and the vows that came from former trespasses and things like this. When you sit in loving community, has said, you say this, I hate, and then you think about, I hate, you hate what? You hate whom? Whom do you hate? And, and the people who are around you say, no, 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 you can let that go. Go ahead and let it go right here. Come on, let it go right here. You can. Come on, I'm with you. And you're just like seething. They go, go ahead, let it go. Go ahead, come on, I'm with you right now. Come on, let it go. I'll never, I'll never this, I'll never that, I'll never this, I'll never that, or they will never, they will never, a man or a woman or an aunt or an uncle, they will never. We make all these vows and in the loving chesed community, God comes in the middle and he rests in our loving devotion and community for one another. And we say, no, I know you're hurting. So one time I was just, it was in this building in the Tampa campus. There's a man, he just, he's a wonderful man, walked with Tamara and I, he and his wife, and he's walked with me. And, and I said, I can't go down there and preach because how, how often do you know that the devil wants to come to disqualify me from teaching you? How often do you think that happens? Yeah, every time I stand here, every time. You know why? My flesh is just like your flesh. So he wants to disqualify me all the time. Just this weekend, I sent a note to a friend and I said, man, can you pray for me? And the best thing in the world is to see somebody reply in the text and say, those are lies. You're qualified because of the blood of Jesus. Get up there and preach. Tim and I and our entire family, we serve in ministry. Our entire family serves in ministry. And we decided a long time ago, even if we continue, even if there's brokenness that occurs, the life that's in Jesus with Hesed community is better than locking ourselves up in this little glass bowl, fishbowl house and saying, I'm not gonna love and relate anymore. Right. It's better. It's worth it. It's worth it. And lastly, group identity. We need joy. We need Hesed, love, a loving community, and we need group. We need, we need group identity. Group identity. Group identity, <laughs> herd immunity. <laughs> Six times a second, our brain is asking, does anybody, does anybody see me? Am I, who am I in the midst of this world right now? And do I matter? And, and what does it matter? What does it look like? And furthermore, our brain, six times a second, a second is asking the question, what do we, everybody say we, what do we act like in this circumstance? What do we act like? What do we act like with sexuality? What do we act like with anger? What do we act like with forgiveness? What do we act like when uh, our tickets are canceled and we're at the airport? Come on, somebody. What do we act like? What do we? And the only way for you to update what you've seen is to see something different. Let me say that again. The only way for you to update what you have seen, because we were all raised with what we saw, good, bad, and ugly sometimes, right? The only way to update that is to be in the circumstance and to see something different. That's Christian discipleship. 
It happens automatically. Ephesians 5, 8 says this about our group identity. Watch. We were once in darkness. Do you remember? Do you remember? Oh, my goodness. Man, I do. Sheesh. But now you're in the light of the Lord. Live as children of the light. In 1 Peter 2, 9, it gets better than that. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, royal, holy, and special. Sounds pretty good to me, doesn't it to you? Sounds pretty special. Here's the definition of character. Our embedded automatic responses to our relational environment, our instantaneous behavior that flows naturally from our heart, the instantaneous, and so this is so convicting to me, the instantaneous autonomic movement from my heart in any circumstance. That's what discipleship looks like. That's what character is. So you can attend church and I can preach and we can talk Christianese. Come on, somebody. We can learn the words, but we'll never be disciples of Jesus the way he's called us, the way he's loved us, and the way his face looks at us, and the way has said community works. We'll never walk into that deeper walk with Jesus until the we is bigger than the I in our lives. The we is bigger than the I in our lives. I remember being uh, in a conversation with a man. I had, uh, I don't know about you, but... Um, you know what I mean? Sexuality was, was this, this thing that was absolutely normalized. It was normalized. And then I had a conversation when I became a Christian with a friend who said, no, 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 that's not what God says at all. I said, Come. I said, what? He said, yeah, it says right here. It says, it says right here. He didn't shame me. He didn't condemn me. He didn't say, you're a heretic. He didn't say, you got to leave my house. He said, no, people who love Jesus act like this. And I said, dang, I'm going to do that. We. We, come on, say we, we, is bigger than I. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. So Christ gave himself, excuse me, so Christ himself, I got a little mixed up. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastor teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Say mature. All right, we're grown up. So what's happened in Christianity is we feel like this linear access to knowledge is what makes us whole. It is not. <laughs> linear access to knowledge only makes your mind change. It never changes your soul. Come on, somebody. Joy, chesed community, group identity changes your soul. It changes the inside of you. And the Bible is saying here that those concepts are what makes a Christian mature into grace. We don't just, it's not by osmosis. It's not just, it's not just by osmosis. It's by, it's almost kinesthetic. Being in the presence of other people who are mature and who love Jesus actually updates the gray matter in your brain. Tom Lane is a senior executive pastor, or he was. Now he's running a whole institute at Gateway uh, Church in Dallas. And every time I'm with him, how many of you know Pastor Tom? Come on, give it up for Pastor Tom. Okay. He's, he's, he's not Jesus, but he's wise and he's caring and he's loving. And when I'm with Pastor Tom and other mature believers, I change. I, I change. So lots of people in the church are never with other people who are further than they are. And so where you are is where you stay. So the other, it was probably a month or two ago, Pastor Tom was here and I caught myself, he was gone. He went back to Dallas and I caught myself. I was having day-to-day -day interactions. I'm like, man, it's, you remember WWJD, what would Jesus do? Yes. Uh, WWTD, what would Tom do? <laughs> I literally caught myself saying, so because here's what I want you to know. The imprint of his person stays with me for a while. Literally, the, the subtleties of how he thinks and how he acts stays with me way more than what he ever says. That's group identity. I want us to, let's do this. Let's make some declaration together. Okay, you ready? Are you with me? Come on, everybody. Are you with me? Sit up, sit up a little bit. All right, do, get a little wiggle. Here we go. Here we go. We'll see these on the screen. 
Uh, say this with me. We, is it on the screen? Okay, here we go. We are a people who spontaneously love our enemies and return blessings for cursing. Come on. We are a people who remind each other who we really are whenever we forget. Come on, can I get an amen? Here we go. Next one. We are a people who share others' pain even when we have caused it. Here we go. Last one. We are a people who choose to see what God is building in others. We are. I tell you what, it's easy to forget. You can go to church and get in the parking lot and be like, you better get out of my way. (laughs) Can't you? But when you're in the context of we and you're in Hesed community, and you're building joy with Jesus, and you're looking at his face, and you're reflecting in faces, other faces that love him, and say, I know you're in some junk, but we're sticking together. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving. You can't, you can't act bad enough to push me away. Why? Because I'm not with you because of what you do. I'm with you because I've been loved. I'm not with you for you to perform. I'm not with you to come up to my standard. I'm not with you because you memorize a verse or don't memorize a verse. I love you. I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm not going anywhere. No matter what happens, I'm not going anywhere. Even if we have to part ways, I'll always love you. Even if we have to do something different, I'll always love you. Even if we move to different states, I'll always love you. We, uh, I told you guys some time ago that we moved into a, a new home and we met our neighbors and I'm just going to be honest with you. I was like, I don't know if I like this. <laughs> Can I be honest? I was like, oh. And uh, I went in the house and my wife and I were talking and, and she said, she said, um, Hey, we should probably remember that God put them there for us. And then I said, dang. That's deep. And then God said, hey, Greg, hey, pastor. I said, yeah, he said, I love them. So we changed our our prayer because our identity is to love people no matter what. That's our identity. I'm not trying to change somebody. I'm trying to reflect the face of Jesus who loves me. Amen. 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 Why don't we pray? Let's pray. Lord Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. We thank you for joy and chesed community. Thank you that love permeates everything that we do. I pray that you'd, you'd draw in sons and daughters. You'd draw them in. And in this moment right now, God, that you would speak, that you would cause people to risk again to try again, to love again, to activate again, to to be with others again. And the joy would fill our lives again and loving community and relationship would fill our lives again and our identity would be stamped by who we are, not by what we do. And so every voice and right here, wherever you are around the world, can we just say this together, Lord Jesus, I surrender. And God, I give you my life. Remember, Jesus died. He was buried, but he was raised from the dead. And he's, he's waiting to come rest his spirit in your life. And so say to the Lord, Lord, I receive all that you want to give me right now. In Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you prayed that way, 
today, wherever you are, would you indicate that to us by just simply raising your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. Would you simply raise your hand? We see you, friends. Raise them nice and tall. Raise your hands nice and tall. Hold them up for us for just a moment. We're, gonna, we're coming to you. We're just gonna, we're, we're bringing to you just a card, just to connect you, just to connect you today. Amen and amen and amen. Anybody else? Simply raise your hand nice and tall. We don't wanna miss you. Anybody else? Amen, amen, amen. Can we give it up for them today? Come on, can we thank God today? Come on, church, can we really celebrate today? Can we celebrate? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play this wonderful video. Why don't we all stand? We're gonna play this wonderful video. I want you to see it now. And in that interchange while we're standing, service is just now ending. We're almost done. In that interchange, when you watch the video, if you need to come, you wanna come. If you raised your hand, you got a card, come forward. We'll pray with you. And then here in just a minute, Pastor Trent is gonna close us in our service. Check the video out. God bless you. We moved here almost two years ago. I had been a Christian and a believer, but had backslid uh, for quite a bit um, of my life leading up to that. When we moved here, we said, we're, we're gonna find a church that, that's a church home. When we came to the crossing, I just, I absolutely fell in love. It was everything that I felt like I had been searching for my whole life. So as far as um, Amber and I's background, neither of us um, have very big families or very much family at all. When we came here and we joined a life group, um, that was really the, the first expression of, of how we felt that type of family and, and community. You know, people wanted to know what we were going through and how they could come alongside us and be with us through um, difficult times and celebrate uh, yeah. the, the joyful ones. It was big, it was really big, it was overwhelming. It was a lot of emotion because I hadn't had that closeness from my own family, so to get that from others and from our life group was just huge. It made me very emotional, it still does, to think about it and um, to know what we've gained out of this life group and this community. The relationships we will undoubtedly have for the rest of our life. 